January 6, 2021 will forever be remembered as one of the most devastating days for our democracy, an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. But Donald Trump's calls for violence started years before, creating an increasingly dangerous feedback loop of violent rhetoric and violent action, all connecting back to Trump. Trump summoned the mob, laid the groundwork for and incited the January 6th insurrection, and thereby disqualified himself from office under the 14th Amendment. Here's where it all started. During his bid for the presidency in 2015 and 2016, Trump showed that promoting political violence was a core part of his candidacy, making blatant calls for violence against protesters at his campaign rallies. I don't know if I'll do the fighting myself or if other people will. Third group, I'll be a little more violent. All right, yeah, get him the hell out of here, will you please? Get him out of here. Throw him out. The next day, Trump told Fox News, Maybe he should have been roughed up because it was absolutely disgusting what he was doing. Trump made thinly veiled threats of shooting people, including his political opponents. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. Hillary wants to abolish, essentially abolish the Second Amendment. By the way, and if she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is. He repeatedly normalized calls for violence during his campaign. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Just knock the hell. I promise you, I will pay for the legal fees, I promise. Uh, I love the old days, you know? You know what I hate? There's a guy totally disruptive, throwing punches, we're not allowed to punch back anymore. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. All right, yeah, get him out. Try not to hurt him. If you do, I'll defend you in court. Don't worry about it. Hey, our Trump rally's the most fun, right? Uh, do we have a good time? We're having a good time. Barely two weeks after Trump said that he'd like to punch a protester in the face, a Trump supporter did exactly that. See, in the good old days, this doesn't happen. <laughs> in the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And then a lie. Watch from a different angle. The protester never sees it coming. And he's wrestled to the ground by deputies. The guy who smacked him goes right back to his seat. Yeah, did you like the event? You bet I liked it. Yeah? What'd you like about it? Knocking the hell out of that big mouth. Yes, he deserved it. The next time we see him, we might have to kill him. The next day, at the presidential debate, Trump denied that his tone incited violence at his rallies and insinuated that the anger towards protesters was justified. People come with tremendous passion and love for the country. When they see what's going on in this country, they have anger that's unbelievable. They have anger. One day later, the Trump supporter was charged with assault. On the same day, Trump doubled down on justifying the supporters' violence, saying, uh, but we've had a couple that were really violent, and the particular one when I said, like to bang them, that was a, uh, a very vicious, very, you know, who's a guy who was swinging, very loud, and then started swinging at the audience. And you know what? The audience swung back. And I thought it was very, very appropriate. He was swinging, he was hitting people, and the audience hit back. And that's what we need a little bit more of. It only got worse when he assumed the presidency. He attacked media outlets by using violent language and caricatures. And by celebrating Representative Greg Gianforte for violently body slamming a reporter during his campaign in 2017, telling the cheering crowd, Any guy that can do a body slam, he's my guy. He's my guy. Following the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which turned deadly when a white supremacist purposefully drove a car into counter-protesters, killing one, 
Trump seemingly equated white supremacist groups and counter-protesters, saying, You had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. He normalized jokes about shooting migrants and his political opponents. But how do you stop these people? You can't. There's no... That's only in the panhandle you can get away with that state. I've come to a place where I've come to the conclusion that the only good Democrat is a dead Democrat. With the arrival and spread of COVID-19 to the U.S., Trump's veiled threats of violence against his perceived political enemies continue to escalate as unrest in states under stay-at-home orders began to fester. In what appeared to be a reference to the Virginia state legislature becoming majority Democratic, Trump told Virginians that their Second Amendment rights were under siege and tweeted his support of Michiganders, Minnesotans, and Virginians protesting against COVID restrictions. Extremists viewed the tweet as a call to arms. Two weeks later, armed protesters stormed the Michigan state capitol. Trump expressed support and admiration for armed protesters, describing them as very good people. When challenged during a presidential debate to condemn white supremacists, he gave what the Proud Boys and other violent extremist groups understood to be direct orders. Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. Uh, after he made this comment, Enrique Terrio, then chairman of the Proud Boys, said on parlor, standing by, sir. During our investigation, we learned that this comment during the presidential debate actually led to an increase in membership from the Proud Boys. Would you say that Proud Boys members increased after the stand back, stand by comment? Exponentially. I'd say tripled, probably, with the potential for a lot more eventually. Senior Proud Boy Joseph Biggs posted that night on the far right social media site Parlor. Trump basically said to go fuck them up. This makes me so happy. The Proud Boys quickly embraced Trump's stand back and stand by directive. Biggs and several other Proud Boys leaders would later be convicted of seditious conspiracy for their role in the January 6 attack. At trial, prosecutors stated the Proud Boys saw themselves as Donald Trump's army. Trump's calls for violence reached a fever pitch as the 2020 election approached, and he spread election fraud lies to explain his defeat and amplified acts of political intimidation against his perceived political enemies. A particularly threatening act of political intimidation happened on October 30th, 2020, when a truck convoy driven by Trump supporters in Texas surrounded a bus of Biden campaign workers, colliding with another car and endangering staffer safety. Instead of condemning the reckless behavior, President Trump tweeted a stylized video of the caravan, captioning it, I love Texas. Two days later, he doubled down, declaring that these patriots did nothing wrong. Later that day, at a rally in Michigan, Trump again celebrated the incident, falsely stating that his supporters who were protecting his bus yesterday because they're nice. So his bus, they had hundreds of cars, Trump, Trump, Trump and the American flag. Two of the Trump convoy's participants later settled a lawsuit accusing them of political intimidation under the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, 42 U.S. Code, Section 1985. After media outlets called the election for Joe Biden, Trump amplified lies about election fraud and violent rhetoric. When the Georgia Secretary of State's Chief Operating Officer Gabriel Sterling directly warned Trump that someone's going to get killed if Trump continued to inspire people to commit potential acts of violence, Trump's response was to double down on election lies instead. It has all gone too far. All of it. Joe DeGeneva today asked for Chris Krebs, a patriot who ran CISA, to be shot. A 20-something tech in Gwinnett County today has death threats and a noose put out saying he should be hung for treason because he was transferring a report on batches from an EMS to a county computer so he could read it. It has to stop. Mr. President, you have not condemned these actions or this language. Senators, 
You have not condemned this language or these actions. This has to stop. We need you to step up, and if you're going to take a position of leadership, show some. My boss, Secretary Raffensperger, his address is out there. They have people doing caravans in their house. They've had people come onto their property. Trisha, his wife of 40 years, is getting sexualized threats through her cell phone. It has to stop. This is elections. This is the backbone of democracy. And all of you who have not said a damn word are complicit in this. I can't begin to explain the level of anger I have right now over this. And every American, every Georgian, Republican and Democrat alike should have that same level of anger. Mr. President, it looks like you likely lost the state of Georgia. We're investigating. There's always a possibility. I get it. And you have the rights to go through the courts. What you don't have the ability to do, and you need to step up and say this, is stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. And it's not right. After the Electoral College cast their votes on December 14th, the election was over. There was no longer any lawful avenue for overturning the election results. Nonetheless, Trump continued with calls to fight and stop the steal. The problem is we need a party that's going to fight. In his now infamous December 19, 2020 tweet, Trump announced, Big protest in D.C. on January 6. Be there, will be wild. Extremists widely understood this tweet as a call to arms, and it began the chain of events that led directly to the insurrection. This tweet initiated a chain of events. The tweet led to the planning for what occurred on January 6th, including by the Proud Boys, who ultimately led the invasion of the Capitol and the violence on that day. A week later, Trump implied that his supporters should consider the fraud that he claimed occurred as an act of war and that they should fight to the death. As January 6 neared, Trump continued to promote January 6 rallies and call on his supporters to fight. If the Liberal Democrats take the Senate and the White House, and they're not taking this White House, we're going to fight like hell, I'll tell you right now. If you don't fight to save your country with everything you have, you're not going to have a country left. On January 6, Trump continued to tweet and made his infamous speech in front of the White House, which gave the mob the green light to surge towards the Capitol after his speech concluded. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. And I actually, I just spoke to Mike. I said, Mike, that doesn't take courage. What takes courage is to do nothing. That takes courage. And then we're stuck with a president who lost the election by a lot. And we have to live with that for four more years. We're just not going to let that happen. And we're going to have to fight much harder because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated. We must stop the steal, and then we must ensure that such outrageous election fraud never happens again, can never be allowed to happen again. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. You are going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, and we're going to the Capitol. We're going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. The protesters followed Trump's orders and went to the Capitol. After learning the Capitol was under assault, Trump poured fuel on the fire. He sent a tweet targeting Vice President Pence for lacking the courage to overturn the election results. Witnesses told the January 6th committee that after the tweet, 
the mob immediately surged. I'm hearing the pits. I hear the pits just caved. No. Is that true? I didn't I'm hear. I'm hearing reports that pits caved. No, I'm telling you, if pits caved, we're gonna drag <laughs> through the streets. You <laughs> politicians are gonna get <laughs> drugged through the streets. Yeah. I guess the hope is that there's such a show of force here that Pence will decide to do the right stuff. thing, according to Trump. The insurrection of January 6 wasn't born overnight. As we've laid out, Trump's encouragement of political violence was smoldering for years. On January 6, he poured gasoline on the fire and watched as his supporters acted on his threats and calls to violence. After January 6, he's only tried to cover it up. Several times, Trump has stated that should he become president again in 2024, he would not only issue blanket pardons to participants in the attack on the Capitol, but also an apology from the government for their unfair treatment. If I run and if I win, we will treat those people from January 6th fairly. We will treat them fairly. And if it requires pardons, we will give them pardons because they are being treated so unfairly. Trump has also gone on record to state that he has been providing financial assistance to members of the mob. So I met with a number of times, but I met with and I'm financially supporting people that uh, are incredible. And they were in my office actually two days ago. Trump has been indicted multiple times this past year. Indictments that are important for holding Trump accountable for his many crimes. But they don't bar Trump from office. Only one legal provision does. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution bars those who engage in or incite insurrections from office after they swore an oath to the Constitution. Based on his role in recruiting, inciting, and enabling a violent mob to attack the Capitol in order to overturn our election on January 6, 2021, Trump engaged in insurrection and is clearly disqualified from office under the Constitution. As soon as the law allows, Crew intends to enforce Trump's disqualification in court.